Welcome. It's very good to be with you today, and I'd like to share some thoughts, if I may, from Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes 2, 22 and 23. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labours under the sun? All his days his work is pain and grief. Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is meaningless. Someone has said that all of us are really at heart one of the characters in Winnie the Pooh. Some of us are bumblers like Pooh himself. Others are tiggers, always bouncing around and full of energy. And then there are the Eeyores, the ones who always see the worst side of things, the perpetual pessimists. And you could easily paint the writer of Ecclesiastes as being one of nature's Eeyores. In some ways Ecclesiastes is a pretty depressing book, full of how meaningless life is and how pointless. And yet it's not that simple, because the writer, the King of Israel, may have been depressed when he looked at the world, but actually he had an unbelievably fulfilled life from a human perspective. He'd done far more than most people could ever dreamed of. He achieved fame, success, popularity, unheard of wealth. And yet there was always that nagging feeling that it was just a waste of time. There's a repeated phrase that comes through the book. This is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I think it comes nine times. But alongside that, there is also a strong undercurrent of the importance of putting God in his rightful place. Now, chapter one has been an introduction to the theme. And here in chapter 2, the writer turns to specific things people look to to provide meaning. First of all, they look to provide meaning in pleasure. Verses 1 to 3 in verse 8. I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish. I tried cheering myself with wine. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well the delights of the heart of man. Pleasure, hedonism, he mentions laughter, alcohol, women. Now we live in a world where pleasure has increasingly become the number one pursuit. You go into any city centre of a weekend, a Friday and Saturday night, and you see the way people behave. Now it's not that the writer lived a life of total excess, but he knew the lure of these things. He tasted them and found them ultimately empty. Laughter is often empty. Many of us will recall the comedian Tony Hancock, the greatest comedian of his age. At the height of his fame in 1961, he was entertaining 30% of the population of the UK, 15 million people every week with Hancock's half hour. Yet in 1968, he took his own life. The same is true of hedonism, just living one's life for pleasure. I suppose Marianne Faithful was one of the most famous celebrities of my youth. She was a singer, long-time girlfriend of Mick Jagger. Well, she once said this, When you've run the gamut of experience, eaten all the forbidden fruits, and found their sweetness turn sickly sour on the tongue, what's left? Well, there's always work. And that's where Solomon turns next, in verses 4 to 11. I undertook great projects, I built houses for myself, I planted vineyards, I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Part of our being made in the image of God is that there is in us a desire to create. And the king did just that. He built houses, gardens, parks, he made reservoirs, he planted vineyards. It was an extraordinary list of achievements. He was like a sort of 10th century BC equivalent of Isabard Kingdom Brunel. And yet at the end of it he finds just the same thing. That it was a chasing after the wind. Meaningless. Nothing gained under the sun. Now, of course, work is a God-given thing. We see what happens when people make huge amounts of money early in their lives and then retire, like some top sportsman may be. What do they do? They can't sit around forever doing nothing because we are made to work. So why doesn't it satisfy? Well, the key is surely in that little phrase that keeps cropping up throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, that little phrase, under the sun. You see, there is no mention of God anywhere in these projects. 
It's a little world within a world, a sort of secular Garden of Eden full of civilised delights, but one where there is no place for God himself. And a world where God is ignored, how can that ever be anything other than deeply unsatisfying? I don't know if you ever watch grand designs on television, and whenever I read this passage I always think of that programme. It's where people set themselves the target of designing and building their own dream houses. And we watch them all through the stages of design and build, and we see the finished product. And often it's startlingly original and attractive. I find it fascinating. I'd love to do the same myself. In fact, my brother is doing almost exactly that himself. But at the same time, it leaves me with a curious sense of hollowness. Because here are people who are trying to create their own Garden of Eden, their vision of perfection. And in the, in the end, it's all in vain, because they will never do it. Without reference to God, it is impossible. Now, as we read on in these verses, we'll see also the king's use of power and possessions in verses 7 to 9. But that too, it seems, uh, is meaningless. Emptiness. If that's all there is, so what? Well, then he turns to wisdom and tries to find meaning there in verses 12 to 16. Then I turn my thoughts to consider wisdom. I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise man has eyes in his head, while the fool walks in the darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I thought in my heart, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said in my heart, this too is meaningless. For the wise man, like the fool, will not be long remembered. In days to come, both will be forgotten. Like the fool, the wise man too must die. The king is not speaking here of philosophy or highbrow wisdom. This is kind of the gentle homespun wisdom of the family. It's about traditional values embedded in society, how to respect one's neighbours, how to control one's tongue, the value of hard work, of listening to others, planning, timekeeping, all eminently sensible. And Solomon recognised the wisdom that there is there. In verse 13 he says, wisdom is better than folly, and so it is. But even having accepted that, he has to admit that in the end, the same fate awaits everyone. The fate of the fool will overtake me also. So what's the point of being wise? If it's the same fate, then life will be forgotten, and it's all pointless. Not long ago I attended the memorial service for the wife of my first vicar. It was a wonderful service. She was a wonderful woman, and I owe both her, both her and her husband a great deal. She was a woman of quiet wisdom of the sort, I think, that the king is speaking of here, and would have applauded. In the service, many fine things were said. There was much warmth and thanksgiving. But I remember thinking at the end, if that's all there is to say about her, so what? She'll soon be forgotten. Just another name on a headstone. Well, from a human perspective, that would be true. That is what life is like under the sun. But of course, there is another perspective which changes everyone and everything. And we'll come to that in a minute. But Solomon now returns to the theme of work. All his toil, all his hard work. And his heart begins to despair of it all. At the end of the day, all goes to somebody else. You can work hard for the things that you have to leave to somebody else who's not worked for them at all. A certain rich man died and the question was asked of him, how much did he leave? And the answer came, everything. And it's true, we leave everything. All his days, his work is pain and grief. Even at night his mind doesn't rest. This too is meaningless. But as I say, this is all with a human perspective. This is life under the sun without reference to God at all. And in the final verses, Solomon just turns our attention to God and begins to bring things into a sharper focus, begins to make sense of things in some way. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the man who pleases him, 
God gives wisdom, knowledge and happiness. But to the sinner he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Now of course it's not a panacea for everything, nor does Solomon understand everything. In some ways the answer is really found only in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the whole book of Ecclesiastes in a sense leaves us with a question. It's a question that's not fully answered. It's a question that's only fully answered when we come to the New Testament and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he does give us a chink of light. He does give us just a glimpse into the future and of where the answer might lie. The perspective that begins to make sense of it all. You see, there is no sense in pleasure if it's just for itself. But God gives pleasure to us because God is a good God. And when we see it in the perspective of God, we realize then that actually pleasure in its rightful place is a wonderful thing. We see it too in work as well, don't we? Work just of itself. You see it in the workaholic, the people who give their whole lives to work. Nobody ever dies and says they wish they spent more time in the office. We see in the sense of work that if that's all there is, then it is empty, it is meaningless. But before God and under God, it makes perfect sense. Because we realize that God created us to work. And work that is sanctified to him, work that is given to him, has all the meaning in the world. We see it in wisdom as well. Homespun wisdom is all very fine. But if it does not have the perspective of God, then it is again empty. But homespun wisdom that recognizes the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That makes real sense. I come back to my first vicar's wife. You could go away from that service and feel it was all rather depressing. She's gone. Just a name on a headstone. Nothing else. But I know that in the light of eternity, her life counted. Because her life wasn't meaningless. It wasn't a chasing after the wind. It wasn't life just under the sun. It was a life lived in the knowledge and the perspective of God. And that's what made it so special. So this leaves us with a challenge then, doesn't it? Where do we look for meaning in life? What matters most to us? Is it pleasure? For many people it is. You look around our world at the moment and that seems to be all that they're interested in. Pleasure. Pleasure is good, provided it is sanctified and holy before God. But not just of itself. Do we look for it in work? Are we obsessed by work? Enslaved to work? Because if we are, in the end it will be meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Maybe it's in worldly wisdom. We fancy ourselves as being some great uh, wisdom of the world. Well, that too, without God, is meaningless. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And what the king leaves us with, therefore, is this perspective. Yes, if you look to these things, you will never find an answer. But if you see them in the light of the perspective of God, then there is a chink of light. And that chink of light finds its full expression in the Lord Jesus Christ.